Aloha, this is Carol Mon Lee for ThinkTech and our series, Life in the Law. And I'm pleased to have our guest today, Marianne Sasaki. Thank you. This is actually her second visit. She was a guest last week on uh, March 8th with Jay Fidel. And uh, she is a lawyer, and she's speaking today about ADR and women in the law and other hot topics. But last week, she spoke about the intersection of the corporate and cannabis Yes. Practice, is that right? Yes, which I'm, I'm heavily involved with. I have a client that's applied for a medical marijuana dispensary license, and I have other clients in other states who are opening up businesses, and, it's, I, and I'm a member of the National Cannabis Bar Association, so I'm really involved in it. Very involved. So I would um, suggest to our viewers that if you would like to hear more about that particular show, to please do go online to thinktechhawaii.com. And... Uh, and search for that particular show on March 8th with um, Marianne Sasaki. So today is part two okay. to cover so many of your other interests and practices. So among the things that you've been doing, I understand, has been ADR, and you have an article coming out soon called Mediation, Justice Without Going to Court, which will appear in the Bar journal. State Bar Journal in, I think, August. That's right. Uh, yeah, I wrote it with Jerry Clay, who's the name Clay of Clay Chapman, and he's a very experienced mediator, and I had taken mediation in school, so we thought we would collaborate. And I was just uh, talking to someone recently about alternate dispute resolution and uh, how how hard it is to go to court, and it's such a clash. You, you have to bring a, a com combatorial spirit to court. Adversarial. That's right, it's adversarial. And often, like, long-time relationships are destroyed, um, there's, there's a price to pay above and beyond the monetary damages. And time. So, yes, right, and, and the expense of l attorneys, which especially, particularly in divorces, if there are any couples that, and they don't, their assets, they don't have tremendous assets, I'm like, you should just split your assets because otherwise you'll just be paying your attorney, you won't have any assets left over to split even. You know, that's like a really key, uh, right. a, a key area that mediation is perfect for. Right, but your focus is on, your article is mediation in business, as a mm -hmm. business solution, is yeah. that right? Mm -hmm. um, I, um, well, I practice family a little bit in New York, but here I practice corporate and real estate law. And uh, we put in our uh, contracts, even before the parties sign, um, a, com a, not, a complex uh, alternate dispute resolution. Usually it says that, you know, uh, this, this, the parties will be uh, will be under the laws of the state of Hawaii, will agree to jurisdiction in Hawaii. Well, we put in our contracts that the parties ha should go to mediation first and try an alternative dispute resolution before they I before they litigate. So this saves the parties a lot of time and money, and I think it's it's like hortatory a little in the sense that it's a little warning that like. These things sometimes do get bumpy, and there's a way to treat it at, when it gets bumpy, you know. So is this a standard practice now to put that clause in all contracts? I or don't think so. I, as hmm. far as I know, you know, I haven't been practicing here that long, so I've only practiced at one firm, and I've only been practicing there six months. Because uh, but you practiced for many years in New, New York, York before yeah. you moved here. Yes, yeah. that's right. And uh, so I haven't had the opportunity to see um, many contracts from other firms, so I can't really say, but I know that it's not used in New York, and I, I want to tell you something. I think it would be frowned upon in New York because people live for the, the fight. They live, <laughs> they live for the fight, you know? So I think litigators would be really opposed to an, an alternative way to settle. And they think they'll lose clients, but they won't because they, the me, in mediation, you're represented by counsel. There's a counsel who's the mediator. So it, it, it's, it's, it's just different, and, and it's new, and lawyers, you know, are so risk-averse risk and, you know, slow to change. So is it uh, then part of the challenge, then, I guess, is also to educate the business client to demand that contracts, new contracts that are being entered into include a clause that requires mediation as a potential Right, right. I mean, we try solution. to introduce that really early on, so the, so the, uh, parties view them, they're partnering in this experience. So they're, they're not, they are not and should never be adversaries. I mean, they should, in the event that it doesn't work out, things don't work out, there can be outcomes that can be 
beneficial to both sides. It doesn't have to be a zero-sum game with a winner and a loser. I mean, different things are important to different people. So, you know, it, it might be important that um, one partner uh, keep the office and the other uh, keep certain clients, or you can work all these things out. You don't have to just say, I'm suing you for the business is worth $3 million, and I'm suing you for half of $3 million, because that'll destroy the business, too, right. you know? Well, is mediation uh, binding, the Well, you can, you can have a binding, um, a, 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 a signed uh, order by the court, and that will be enforceable by the court if, it, if, if the mediator so requests it, and the party so requests it. But in the contract itself, would it say uh, mediation is binding? Well, I'd say it's a provision of the contract. Mm -hmm. It's it's a provision of the contract. So, uh, you know, I would imagine that it's as binding as any other provision is. So, uh, the clients certainly know about it when we we address it, and and uh, because you know Jerry Clay, um, he's been involved many years in in, in mediation, and uh, he's just. He's just so experienced at it. He's seen so, such good outcomes where there, where there could have been just deadlocks. You know, so he's very skilled. He's very skilled at, at breaking the deadlock. Because sometimes people get entrenched in their position, and they don't even think of an alternative position. Right. They need help. It's interesting you mentioned New York practice, because what I've seen here in Hawaii is that so many retired judges go into mediation as a career uh, on retirement as, you know, on, the, on the bench. It's good. Well, for a number of reasons. One is obviously they're very familiar with the law. But um, we say a good mediator has gravitas, which is the authority, the experience, um, the emotional authority experience, and the uh, business experience to speak to both sides. Both sides have to listen. A judge is in a big courtroom. He's sitting high up here. He has magisterial robes on. You're going to listen to the judge. So you have to have something in the, that makes the parties treat the mediator as though you were a judge. And that we call gravitas. And so obviously, a lot of retired judges have that. They, they've cultivated it over many years. So, hmm. yeah. Okay. Well, great. Let's also talk about your blog. I know that you are. <laughs> yes. Hawaii uh, Transactional is my blog. Hawaii Transactional. Yes. And how often do you? Well, I've been remiss because I've been really busy, but I, I, I get there. I try to get there every week, but I haven't been so good lately. I, because, you know, with the medical marijuana um, license, that was such a full court press to get that in. It was such a complex uh, process that, that I, I didn't have a minute, you know, to do. This is my blog for me is fun. That's that's my you know where I have where I have fun in the long where, you know, so I ha I haven't really had a chance to do it. But I'm on Twitter and I'm I have a Hawaii transactional and I'll you know how do we find the blog? Just you can just put my name in or Marianne Sazaki. Yeah, or HawaiiTransactional.com. HawaiiTransactional.com and we will get to log on to. Um, Read your blog, right? And I have basis. you know quotes about the law, the thing, things that uh, you know, precepts that I believe in. I, I keep uh, the Hawaii Women's Law Association um, their meetings. I post up there so you know everybody can know that we're having a lunch on the twenty second, and or topics that we've discussed in the meetings. And the Hawaii Women's Law Association now has this great program where they give CLEs during the luncheon. Yes. So it's terrific. Mm -hmm. It's just terrific. So did you just start this blog in Hawaii? Did you have a similar blog in New York? I had a blog in New York, but it wasn't a wasn't a it was a personal blog, and it actually got quite a bit of attention. And uh, it it was a, the nascence of blogging. I, I started in about two thousand one, and I did it from about two thousand one or two to two thousand five or six, just because I like to write thoughts. But I will say one thing that I'm very proud of in that blog. The day after uh, President Obama gave the uh, speech to the Democratic Convention, he was the opening speaker, I wrote on my blog, for all to see and for history, this is the next president of our United <laughs> States. Very precious. <laughs> yeah, Very right. good. So I, I, it's memorialized. I have that, you know, the, the rest of it was just kind of thoughts and ramblings and thoughts about Brooklyn and my grandparents and my Italian background and all kinds of things like that. So your current blog, is there a measure of what your viewership is on that? Uh, 
I don't know what it is. I don't. I don't uh, religiously check. I, you know, it's it's probably very small because it's very new, and I have been negligent over the past couple of months. I have to say, but um, it is like the top one of the top hits. If you put my name in, it comes out as a top hit, and if you put in Twy Transactional, it is the top hit. It's for transactional lawyers, which I am. Mm -hmm. And so, how big is the transactional lawyer population here in Hawaii? You know. I would think, and I have no figures, uh, that it's fairly large because the, with all the real estate development that goes on in Hawaii, those are all business transactions. Um, as particularly now, the economy is, is flourishing and uh, there's a lot of building projects going on. So I would say that uh, probably more than 50% are transactional lawyers. Um, it's great. It's great work if you can get it. I mean, not everybody's lucky enough because you have to be with a, a, a firm, you know, because you, you, that's you need the backup of other lawyers. And uh, I, I was saying to Jay earlier, I I could have been a litigator. I could have been. I, I'm sure I could have been a very good litigator. I, I'm outspoken. I write well. I, I yeah. But I'm not said, afraid. Yeah, I'm unafraid. <laughs> Sometimes too unafraid. Um, uh, so, but I said to myself, do I really want to become that person? Do I really want to become that person that's, you know, always contentious, always, you know, driven to win? Every point is a point of disputation. No, I really didn't want to become that person, you know? I mean, I'm naturally like that. Why would I want to encourage this? <laughs> so yeah, a transactional yeah. lawyer who promotes mediation. Yes. A healthy right. balance. Yes, you want to, you want to, you want to bring people together. You want deals to take place. You want, particularly, you know, I like to deal with, uh, small, closely held corporations, family businesses. We just did a, a transaction where a woman-owned business uh, just sold her business to her two daughters. That's I love that. That's what I live for. That you know, a successful woman creating two more successful women. It's just it doesn't get better than that. Okay, great. You mentioned New York, and I wanted to. Today, of course, the big announcement by President Obama was his nomination to the Supreme Court, Merrick Garland. From right. The um, court of uh, district court, court of in, appeals is in, in DC. DC. Yeah. Right, and uh, we talked a little bit earlier. But do you? What is your opinion of his? Um, my o my only issue with him. First of all, I have to say that um, uh, I'm very liberal, <laughs> and so um, sometimes people ask me, you know, what what is your political stripe? I say I'm French. That's how <laughs> liberal I am. But I know, which may, may now the whole, entire uh, Hawaii legal community knows my, my political position, but the, hey, that's what it is. Um, so uh, uh, he was a prosecutor, and I often am wary of prosecutors because they sort of, um, I think he's a proponent of uh, you know, diminished rights, increased uh, surveillance, and that sort of thing, and I'm, I'm opposed to that, and Jay and I have had many discussions about that. So. But, but on other issues, on social issues, he's, he's liberal. So, but I just think he's a test rabbit to see if the, mm -hmm. the, the GOP will even have a hearing. I mean, I think he's, he's, just, he's just sort of a sacrifice. I don't know. Right. Did you know any of uh, the justices, Justice Sotomayor? Or? I didn't. One of my friends clerked for Justice Sotomayor when she was in, uh, in district court. Um, she said she was terrific, just terrific, a really a down-to-earth person. And the only other justice I ever met was Judge Souter. I would have loved to have met Scalia. But J Judge Souter was also a great guy, yeah. a very down to earth guy. But I don't, I, you would think that, you know, all these justices seem to come out of Harvard and they, they, they're floating around. You'd think that I'd know You'd more. see them, yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> but, well, before we go to our break, uh, we've had the pleasure, the University of Hawaii School of Law has had a program, Juris in Residence. We have had several of the Supreme Court justices come to Hawaii over the years, so That's hopefully terrific. you get an opportunity to meet. That would be and great. maybe the new one. Right. one of these well, I, I heard um, that uh, the very first graduate of the William S. Richardson Law School has been accepted as a Supreme uh, Court, Court clerk. Yeah, clerk. Exactly. I think that's terrific. Yes. I, by Sotomayor, I think. Is it? Yes, or, I yeah, believe. Yeah. Right. I think that's terrific. Right. Well, we'll be right back. We're going to a short break. This is Carol Mon Lee with my guest, Marianne Sazaki, Life in the Law. Thank you. Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Josh Green. I'm the host of a program called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm a physician. I work in the emergency department on the Big Island. I also serve in the state senate, which please don't hold that against me, doesn't detract from my television program. We speak about all the big healthcare issues in the state. 
We get together on Tuesdays from 2 o'clock till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And we try to talk about the most important issues in health care. This is a terrific venue for people to learn about health care. There are many programs on this, on this station. We broadcast it later, uh, not just on the Internet, but also on OC16. Thanks for joining us. Please be informed health care consumers. Aloha, I'm Kawe Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday at 3 p.m. We address issues of importance for those of us who live here on the most isolated landmass on the planet. Please come join me Fridays at 3 p.m. Mahalo. Welcome back. This is Carol Mon Lee, Life in the Law, and I'm speaking with Marianne Sazaki, an attorney from New York, graduate of Harvard Law School, who has moved to Hawaii the last year and is now working at Clay Chapman and has a very, very interesting practice. And this is part two of our interview with her. So, so Marianne, tell me about your practice in New York and your practice here, particularly as it relates to women, because I know you at, at Harvard you were involved in the Women's Law Journal, Journal right. and here you're involved in Hawaii Women Lawyers yeah. and, uh, and the Harvard w Women's uh, Law Association also. Um, <coughs> uh, is there a difference with, with respect to the way women are treated? Um, yes. I, you know, I think in general the bar is much kinder here. In Hawaii? Yes. It's, uh, in New York, everyone works all the time. Everyone is expected to work all the time. And every, I mean, I always say people from New York have like two topics of conversation. They, how much is your apartment? And, <laughs> and, how, and, and you know, what, how much did you work last week? I mean, How many hours did you yeah, build? Yeah, and right, exactly. And, and where should we go for dinner, right? <laughs> so, so, but here, people have a fuller and richer lives and they bring that to the workplace. And there's less, um, they're, they're much less mean-spirited. I worked for some large law firms in New York, and some of the p partners that are under a tremendous amount of pressure can get pretty, c pretty tough. Are we talking about male or female? Uh, male, but you know, I've met women too that um, sort of feel like they got there on their own, and so you should as well. And. Um, uh, but but here I've I've had actually the opposite experience. Everybody's been very supportive. Um, they they make it very clear they want me to do very well. Um, do you have many women law partners? In there's place? no. And as a matter of fact, we just we just made three partners, and there was a picture of the partners uh, uh, on our website. And I said, oh, there's something wrong with that picture. And they're like, oh, what's wrong with it? I said. No women. <laughs> <laughs> How many attorneys at Clay Chapman? There's about 25. Uh, I, there's a four or five women. Uh, I'd like to see more. Mm -hmm. I've been pushing for more. Uh, but yet, still and yet, it's, it's, it's I, better than in New York. I tell you, I was reading an interesting ar article in the American Bar Journal today about how women lawyers of color at large law firms are leaving in droves because there's no path for, to partnership for them. And you know, the same can be said for women in general. You know, men don't realize how much they bond with the younger men, whether they talk about golf. Or, I mean, I've sat through so many conversations about golf and basketball and uh, football and the Super Bowl, and I don't know anything about any of those things. <laughs> and, and, but, y you know, y y women need that kind of bonding experience with, with the male partners too because they're, they're the predominant you know partners so um, and discussion about children or um, other things that might be considered right. more well I'm happy to report here in Hawaii the male partners are very involved with their children in fact I have one male partner who flat out on my interview said to me you know my kids are like my priority so uh, you know you you can you can work as much or as little as you want but I, but my my kids come first and I thought that's Refreshing. great yeah and you would never, you would never get that in New York. As a matter of fact, I mean, people have two or three nannies, you know, in New York, and because they just keep this highly pressured. They work all weekend, all week. I, I, I never had a Christmas off until uh, this year. Christmas Day. Yeah, yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. And I always worked on Thanksgiving and Christmas. How sad. Yeah. I know. But it's, but I wasn't alone. <laughs> well, in terms of, uh, well, let's say, quality of work or. 
Um, we've talked a little bit about the style, but how do you compare the types of work that uh, women as lawyers in New York might um, be responsible for versus here? Is well, there a difference? I, no, I don't think so. I mean, I think if you're good, you're good. And people want you on their team because they know you write well or they know you're a good, clear thinker. And um, even in spite of the fact that you're a woman, they'll, they'll say, come on to this transaction with they'll me. They'll ignore that. Yeah, they'll be, it's okay with us. We understand, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but, but uh, I, I don't know. I think, I think Hawaii is more inclusive. I have to say, I really do. I mean, you know, it's, I, I said to you earlier about the cross-cultural uh, influences in Hawaii, and there are cross-cultural influences in New York, too, but they're far more integrated here. Like my husband's Japanese and Caucasian. And that interweaving makes for a lot of different ideas of what, how to, how to, what's appropriate behavior in the workplace. And it makes it very interesting. So you can take a lot of approaches. You can take a more conciliatory approach. You can take a more aggressive approach. You know, in New York, it's just basically aggressive. aggressive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. I've learned a lot about you know dealing with Japanese businessmen and um, certain. Uh, I'm learning every day about you know etiquette with respect to business, with doing business with people from the Asia, and it's it's fascinating. I, I, I love it. I hope I haven't made too many faux pas. <laughs> I understand you have something called a women's initiative at work. What is we that? do. It's. Well, we belong to a group called Alpha, and I don't even remember what the acronym stands for, but basically it's a worldwide uh, law firm. It's a consortium of law firms. And um, we, as a member of Alpha, I, I head up the Women's Initiative, and part, you know, my, my, ma my main mission is to m have more women partners, have more women associates, just have more voices at the table, you know, just people being heard. I mean, it, 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 and, and having the partners not, learn how to interact with the women. I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I mentor a lot of women. Now, I, one of the partners said to me, I think I said this to you, they, they, they loved my motherly instinct, right? I like, I was like, I know you're, that's a compliment, I know you really mean well, but you know, you it's need to, talk to learn to talk to me like a lawyer. Like, or, or I was out with a client, and he paid the bill, and he said, um, I'd never let a girl pay. <laughs> and I'm, I'm like, you're a doll. You're sweet, but I'm not a girl. I'm a lawyer. <laughs> I'm no girl. I'm a lawyer. But um, so th that was here. Yeah. So bridging that gap, people do, just don't know how to speak to women in a professional setting. They always sort of relate to them as, my mother, my sister, my daughter, they need, they need to regard us just as prof professionals, just, just as they are. You know, we're not, we're not necessarily a byproduct, the cultural byproduct of, of, this, of the system, you know. Well, do you, when did you graduate from law school? Oh, a long time. 1994, so a long okay. time ago. Well, I graduated in 74, so well, that's 20 years a long years time ago, ago too. <laughs> but now we have graduates, of course, 2016, many, many, many years later. Um, do you see a difference in, because I see a difference in the women graduates of now and their uh, presumption of expectations, expectations mm -hmm. exactly. Well, and the whole generation, mm -hmm. even the, the men, I mean, they, there's no distinction. They, they grew up in, in, in households where um, people worked very hard to not have specific gender roles, maybe a working mother. Um, a professional mother, uh, maybe a stay-at-home dad, and as far as I can tell, the m millennials they have they have no discrimination amongst them. They hang out in groups. They don't. Uh, it, it's terrific. It's terrific to to see. Uh, you know, they just don't relate. They relate to each other as people, and the, and this is true not only with intergender but in interracial relationships. I see this. There's lots of mixed race millennials, and people are very comfortable with race and 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 and, and sexual preference. The, they're a great generation. They really are terrific, and they and a, a woman coming out of law school today wouldn't even. I mean, when I, you know, when I first came out of law school, I was like, oh, you know, I hope I hope they take me seriously. But they, I don't think they even think that at all anymore. They just assume that their their work is as good as anybody else's, and you know, they don't. 
you know. And yet you mentioned that there still is a um, difficult road ahead if they would like to become partner in a law firm. Well, I only say that because there are so few. I mean, I know women partners from the Hawaii Women's Law Association, but I see that the bar is largely male. The partnership of the bar is largely male. And, you know, women drop out for a number of reasons. They go work in-house because it's more amenable maybe to the choices they've made. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, it's very hard to be, to be a partner and you be a man or a woman and make partner because you really have to devote all your energy to it. But if, if, you have, if you're married and you, I'm lucky I'm married, I have somebody that he, he's, he stay, he's at home right now, so he does all the, the, all the support work. So I have the freedom to you know, do what I really have to do, like do a TV show or, or you know, write an article. But without that, it's, it's very hard you know, to, to devote, you have to devote all your energy to your, it's your baby really, your, 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 your practice. Right, and you said you're very involved in Hawaii Women Lawyers. What particular projects are you involved in? Uh, well, I j I'm, we just bought a table. There's a Hawaii Women Law Association Awards dinner coming up. Right. And I prevailed upon the firm to buy a table. This is the very first time they've Wonderful. ever bought a table. And um, I invited all the women, and since, of course, there weren't enough women to fill the table, I invited all the women attending law school as well. Because I told them that, you know, it's never too soon to start networking and meeting people. And uh, I'm going to talk to them, I think, about possibly videotaping the CLEs that they've just started giving. Because why shouldn't people be able to get CLEs online? Right. That would be kind of a great... Uh, idea. And aside from just going to functions and, and uh, going to luncheons and... There's an it, educational component too, right? Right, there is. And it, it, it we talked about CLE, to yeah. Continuing Legal Education mm -hmm. Credit for lawyers who are required to uh, attend a minimum of um, three, class, they have three credits, three a, credits year. a year. Mm -hmm. All right. So, yeah, but there's a, a bit larger learning component too. There are women who um, talk about we, like, for example, we had um, a panel discussion of women in the judiciary, and they talk about th their path to the judiciary and your possible path to the judiciary. We always have alerts when there are openings. They, people are encouraged to apply. And we, we had also uh, a, count, uh, uh, a panel on in-house counsel, and that was very interesting, and that's a very different type of practice. So women are bringing their experiences to help other women to make choices, you know, which is terrific. Right. Do yeah. you see for the in the future for you uh, an interest in serving on the bench? Yeah, I, I, I do. Oh, you do? Okay. <laughs> I would Good. love it. I would love it. I would. I, I mean, I'm not, but although I'm not on that path, so, but um, I've been told I'd be a good judge. Um, my father-in-law thinks I would be a good judge. My father-in-law the judge. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, but I'm not on that path, so I, I think that's just kind of, I have, you know, dreams, uh, you know, pipe dreams of, you know, various things, and sometimes you can only pick one path. So you typically litigators and people in public service are, are judges, so I don't know that a, a transactional partner at a law firm would necessarily be entertained, but we'll see. I'm just we'll here. See. I'm only here a year. Okay, <laughs> just we'll a year. give you time. <laughs> Well, on that note, we're going to take a short break. This is Carol Mon Lee, Life in the Law, with my guest, Marianne Sasaki, talking about ADR, women in the law, and other hot topics. We'll be right back. Okay, this is Think Tech Hawaii, and it's Wednesday. Every Wednesday is Energy Wednesday here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy, 4 to 5 p.m. every Wednesday. Come and listen to us. And just to show you what I mean, I'm going to ask Sharon to tell us more. Come and see us every Wednesday, as Jay said. And we have people like Jim Albers from HECO here and co-host Ray Starling here every Wednesday. We not only go on Olelo and OC16, but also stream live. So please come visit us, hear about the latest in clean energy. Okay, Jim, you've been here. You got any comment on all this? As important as energy is in all of our lives today, this is a great forum and a great format to vet those issues. So I encourage everybody to listen in and participate Okay, Ray, what do you think for a close? Well, I, I think this is the greatest show uh, in the energy world here in Hawaii. Uh, you can come here every week, one hour, and catch the latest on what's happening and hear from the people who really know what's going on, uh, like Jim Alberts. We appreciate your coming today. Thank you. Ray Starling, Sharon Moriwaki, Jim Alberts. 
at Jay Fidel here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy, Aloha. 4 to 5 p.m. Wednesday. Aloha. Aloha. Welcome back. This is Carol Monley with my guest, Marianne Sazaki, who moved from New York to Hawaii to practice law about a year ago. So, and we actually are going to start out with a tweet here from Hawaii Living. Can a lawyer in Hawaii make it in New York City and vice versa? And it's been said New York City is polar opposite of Hawaii. Your thoughts? It's very interesting because this is what we thought we would start right. to talk about. People have said that to me, but as I said, I don't think it's so polar opposite because of the, the exchange of cultures. It's different cultures. I mean, New York is mainly European cultures and Hawaii's uh, Asian and South East Asian cultures. But when you bring that blend of people into the mix, it's a very protein growing environment. There's always a new wave of immigration. There's always some new uh, business class, you know, I mean, class of people engaged in business. So it, in that way, it's, it's very similar. Um, I think a Hawaii lawyer can make it in New York. I don't see why not. But you have to, you have to pay the price, which is basically working all the time. <laughs> so well, as long as you're willing to work all the time, they'll be happy to have you. <laughs> well, then let's talk a little bit about the style, though, the style of practice here, the lifestyle being, as we always say, we have more of a slower, more relaxed, yeah, and as you described, uh, a more well-rounded life mm -hmm. balance as opposed to New York City, where you said you're working harder. So what kind of temperament would a person from Hawaii need to be able to be successful in a New York City practice, besides being hardworking? Well, I think you need to, um, it helps to be well-educated, it helps to be driven, to keep your eye on the prize, and to, as, as in Hawaii, network, network, network. I mean, really at the end of the day, and I always say, that, say this to the young women who, who I mentor, <laughs> that uh, the, the key at the end of the day is the business you bring in. I mean, you can be the very best lawyer, you can be the very, very, very best lawyer, but you won't get the respect and the money you deserve unless you have the business. So you have to get out there and be, put yourself in a position to meet people. Funnily enough, I found that easier in Hawaii because of the clubs, I belong to a number of clubs. I belong to the Exchange Club, I belong to the Waikiki Yacht Club, and while these are social clubs, business is, is done socially as well, you know? So uh, in New York, it's a little harder to break into the, the circles of, 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 you know, the people that have business. You have to know somebody or know somebody that knows somebody or somebody's father has to be, you know, the- A member. Yeah, exactly. Generation. It's a little harder. It's a, well, you know what I love about Hawaii? It's tiny. Like, you can pick up the phone and speak to anybody. Like, um, I had a, a, an issue, um, a question for uh, Senator uh, Will uh, Abero? Espero. Espero. Yes. And I just called him up, and he picked up his own <laughs> phone, and I said, hi, you know, there's this, there's this question about, you know, attaching documents to this application. And he said, oh, would you be willing to speak to some more people about that? And I said, like, certainly. But, you, like, I feel like I could call Tulsi Gabbard, and she'd be like, is everything going okay over there? Because, you know, we want to know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's great. It's a great feeling because, you know, that's what's hard about living in New York. You're really anonymous. You're really Very anonymous. anonymous. Right. Now, what would happen, though, for a woman, let's say a woman from Hawaii moving to New York City, capable, intelligent, hardworking, right connections, but um, would she be run over, I guess is the best word, by the um, oppressive kind of uh, hardcore style of... Yes. Know, the uh, well, you know, it's... Either e one of two things would happen: either that person would learn the style, or would would return back to Hawaii because it, for everyone it, in New York, it's sink or swim. And it's um, it who said it? E. B. White, the writer, said uh, you have to be willing to be lucky to live in New York. You have to you have to really embrace it and. Uh, e you, and never forget, every year there are droves and droves of people coming to this place from all over. And that's who you're in competition with. You're in competition from the fresh young faces every year, you know, aspiring. But, but having said that, I would never um, counsel anybody not to try it. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think it's, even if you just live there for a few years, I think it's a great experience. It's very glamorous. It's very, you know, the people are very cultured. You, 
opportunities yeah. in terms of cult, as you say. Yeah, museums yeah. and the opera. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've been to the opera in Hawaii and I've been to the opera in New York and it's quite a different experience. So I would encourage whoever tweeted to, to if they're thinking about it, give it a try <laughs> if they can. So tell me about your transition here to Hawaii and how that worked out and you well, moved here because of your husband? Yeah, well, my husband's family, yeah, my, fa mm -hmm. my father was getting older, and my husband wanted to be closer to his family. And I, frankly, was, after ha having lived in Manhattan 30-something years, was tired of the pace myself. So we moved here, and um, I think one of the most striking things about my move here, and I would not advise this to other people, is that I came without a job, without a law license, um, without really very many connections, only my husband's family. And... Uh, I didn't know what that was going to be like. I didn't, I didn't know if I would get a job. I did not know if I, at this age, was capable of passing the bar again. I mean, it's a lot of retention. I don't retain, retain as much as I used to. Um, and so it was a, quite a big midlife leap. Mm -hmm. And um, it's shaken everything up. My whole my life is completely different, uh, you know, com just completely different. Um, but having, having said that, I've landed on my feet, and I've been, I've been willing to be lucky in Honolulu, so I've been lucky in Honolulu. And so how did you network besides through your f husband's family? Um, what did you do? Well, what the Hawaii Women's Law Association was key. Um, through socializing with my clients, I'm, I, I, I just, I'm fascinated. Almost anything fascinates me. So if, if you have a business where you... I don't know, construct furniture or, or market furniture. I'm fascinated. How did you get into that? What kind of market is there? Is there? Do you have any issues with being a woman, get, being heard? And I, I was speaking to a woman architect recently who was the head of a large architecture firm, and I said, was that hard to get to the, you know, the top of an architect firm? And she said, you know, it took some work. So I, I put myself out there. I go to a lot of uh, PBN conferences. Uh, Pacific Business News, yes. the different career yeah, like conferences, mm -hmm. small, they, they have breakfasts and things like that. And my, the partners of my firm have been very good about um, sending me to any convention I've been interested in, any gathering. Uh, Are you doing a lot of public speaking yourself? I haven't, I haven't really done much public speaking, but I haven't been here that long. I, I'm, I feel that I, I'm so lucky just to have made, met the people I've met. I mean, I, I know so many people and I already have a small client base which I think in, the, in six months is not bad, you know? Great. So it's, it's like all possible, you, you know, which is a nice feeling in middle age. And know. so what, what do you see in the future? Are you staying here in Hawaii? Oh, I'm absolutely staying. There's no, I'll never go back. I, I just, never I'll go never, back. I'll never, I mean, I, I visit my mother's there and, you know, like power to my mother. She, she, she said, you know, when I said to her mom, you know, listen, if you don't want me to go, I won't go. You're 83, you know. She said, no, go, do, the, do what's best for you. Just go and enjoy it. And, and so I, that was really a real support to know that she was behind me. And, uh, and no, my, my plan is to make partner and, uh, and become more and more involved in the Hawaii legal community and do as many interesting things as I can. As I said, you know, I'm, I am unafraid. I have to say I'm very bold, so. Anything could happen, really. So in addition to practice and community work, Hawaii Women Lawyers and exchange and writing, writing. you're doing a lot of writing. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I love to write. I really do. And What I, else are you working on? That's well, Jerry and I are thinking of working on a, a piece about partnering, which is basically um, bringing companies together before they even sign the contract. It's like the beginning of mediation. Like, mediation is at the end. Partnering ha happens at the beginning. So we're, we're thinking of writing a, uh, an article about that or an article about the techniques of mediation. I want to, for the American Bar Journal, uh, write an article on marijuana and like the changing morality associated with marijuana. Because, you know, it's no, there's really very little stigma. I mean, it, it's, it's really it, fascinating to watch the change in people's attitudes. I mean, and I, I use my mother as a barometer. When the day my mother said, oh, why shouldn't gay people get married? I knew that it was going to be, this is a done deal. She's an 83-year-old woman in Brooklyn, so she thinks that it's done. And, and the same thing is true about marijuana. She's like, oh, what's the big deal? It's not such a big deal. It's like having a drink. And so I said, okay, well, if, if you think so. 
<laughs> so do you find a difference between the New York culture and the, and the Hawaii culture? I think it's even more accepted here. Mm -hmm. People are more uptight. They, look, in New York, I, they, they don't use such mellow drugs. If they use drugs, they use it's harder. <laughs> yeah, they do, so they can work more. Mm -hmm. But here it's very like mellow, and it's been around forever. And so, How did you get involved in the, maybe Jay covered that, but I'm interested. Oh, how did I get involved? In uh, we, we were referred, because I'm a securities lawyer, and there aren't that many securities lawyers in, in Hawaii. I, I, I did, when I was in New York, I did mergers and acquisitions, corporate governance, um, compliance with the SEC. The, the, the uh, company that we were working for was doing an offering of, uh, of membership interest in their company to start this business. So they needed the whole corporate component right. aside, on top, aside from the whole medical marijuana component, compliance component. So I did all their corporate work. And I, I, you know, I wrote a private placement memorandum for them. We did subscription agreements. The investors had to be accredited. And uh, we wrote their operating agreement. We really set them up. You know, as I say, medical marijuana businesses are businesses like any other. They need lawyers. They do. They need. They have the same issues: um, employment contracts. Uh, you know, fulfillment contracts. You know, it's not. They're not going to be anything different than if you are making furniture somewhere or or have an orchard for sure. So, any is, is it's a growing field, obviously. Oh, it's in hugely Hawaii. growing. Mm -hmm. And every state that has had medical marijuana has has had, and th those people have been most successful, the people that have been in the medical marijuana field, they have been most successful in the recreational marijuana field. So in other words, if you're in early, you're, you're, you're in, you, it's, it's, it's very beneficial. As so, opposed to the medical side? Well, when you say it, the re recreational, recreational. Is, is anybody can do. We don't have recreational. No. Washington, ha um, Oregon has recreational. Washington has, re Colorado has recreational. And I think it ultimately, and so does uh, Senator, Senator Sparrow. Sparrow. <laughs> we think within 10 years it, there'll be recreational use of marijuana. And that the people who have been in at the medical marijuana stage will be that much more in advanced in the business. Right. They'd, right. Be more, uh, they'd be a mature business rather than a starting business. So what percentage of your work do you work on the cannabis uh, business? Well, right before we did the license, uh, it was all virtually 100%, but now I would say it's about 25% or 30%. Um, we're working with a group that has basically a medical marijuana franchise. They set up retail operations in every state. They all look alike. It's like the McDonald's of, of me MIPS, these med marijuana infused products. And ah. so there's candy, there's cake, there's oils. There's so they set up these retail venues for MIPS and, and they're all alike. They're franchises. Wow. Yeah, it's exciting. Well, we just have a few more seconds, Marianne, and this has been so fascinating. And as again, this has been part two of a conversation with Marianne Sasaki, and I think there will be more parts to this conversation, whether you're sitting at this seat or, or that seat. I hope so. I, I think this is so much fun. I, I think this is a great project. I, I just love coming here. Well, we want to welcome you to Hawaii. Thank you. And we appreciate your spending time with ThinkTech talking about so many different things, business, uh, cannabis, women in the law, and uh, we wish you the best of luck oh, in thanks your new so much. position here in Hawaii. So thanks. this is Carol Man Lee on behalf of ThinkTech Hawaii and our series Life in the Law. Thank you so much, and we'll see you again. Aloha.